Welcome to the October 12th, 2017 meeting of the Historic Resources Board. Will staff please call roll? Certainly. Chair Bernstein? Here. Vice Chair Bauer? Here. Uh, Member McKinnon? Here. Member Wimmer? Here. Member Kohler? Here. Member Benenberg? Here. We have uh, Councilwoman Holman. Okay, thank you. Uh, first we, on our agenda is oral communications. If there are any members of the public who would like to speak, I have one card from uh, Council Member Holman. Please, welcome. Thank you. Um, before you, you have a um, sponsorship sheet from the uh, CPF conference. And I'm here this morning as the um, chair of the chair of the uh, committee to um, ask you as individual members of the community and as members especially of the Historic Resources Board to consider making a uh, sponsorship level a contribution to the success of the CPF conference. Obviously the HRB does not have a uh, budget so this would be something that you as individuals would collaborate on and decide about what level of sponsorship you would, you would like to uh, provide to support the conference. The conference has not been here for 30 years uh, so as of next year. And so it's really important that this be a successful conference. And we want to represent our city and our Palo Alto Stanford community very, very well. Uh, last night at the Palo Alto Stanford Heritage uh, Board meeting, $5,000 was committed uh, by that board. They said it could be used as a matching uh, challenge as well. Uh, you'll notice, um, I'm hoping that the board will see fit to do something uh, along those lines, but you'll notice at the uh, pillar, uh, $2,500 range, that actually has seven, uh, seven entrants. Uh, so what, what this means is like for the California Preservation Conference, it has uh, two, the pillar has, I'm sorry, the pillar has uh, three memberships or for that, registrations for that. The President's re Circle reception, two people can go to that. The opening reception, two people can go to that. So that happens to be seven people. You can divide them up as you wish, or you could prorate them however you wish, but I'm hoping that as individuals you will get together so the Historic Resources Board can be represented in a very um, obvious and um, uh, public way at the uh, CPF conference. So thank you very much. And also, um, CPF uh, board is, or CPF staff is a little bit shorthanded right now. So uh, just know that those of you who volunteered to uh, serve on the committees, there will be a meeting next Tuesday, next excuse me, next Wednesday at uh, 2:30. If you haven't seen that email yet this morning, so I appreciate your consideration. And uh, maybe through the chair, you could communicate back to me about any uh, commitment that you're uh, interested in making. Thank you. And. Thank you, yes. And is there a, a place that, that we should say something or uh, agree to some sponsorship money or um, how See, do we handle that? Would uh, Council Member Holman, would you care to respond to uh, Beth Mattermary's comment? I'm not clear on the question, what do you mean some place? You could have, you'll have, depending on the level of contribution, you can see where, here where the marketing benefits are, uh, so what the uh, publication opportunities are with sponsorship levels. So that way, um, there would be published sponsorship recognition of uh, the Historic Resources Board. Does that answer the question, Beth? We need, we need your, uh, uh, Beth, we need your light on, please. I don't see a paper the color of yours and... Oh, it's the same thing. This is just, I just want to make sure I kept one for me. It's the same thing. Uh, and we can talk, we can talk offline if you'd like, because this is a, uh, not specifically an HRB action. It's one that I just hope the HRB will, uh, will back. But it's an right. individual, uh, individual decisions among HRB members. But I'm happy to talk with anybody who has questions. Is there on here a um, date? Uh, yes, um, I didn't see it it's, it's, not on, it's not on here, but the conference is next May, um, as it always is. It's Preservation Month in California, and it will be uh, May 17 to 20. It may possibly be the 18th to 20th, uh, but right now it's scheduled for the 17th to the 20th. Okay, thank anything you. Anything else? Beth, you have your light on. Any, anything else? Okay. Again, we can talk offline if anybody right. has any questions, sure. and appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other members of the public like to speak to us on any item not on the agenda? 
Seeing none, moving to uh, if there are any agenda changes, additions, and deletions. None. Thank you. City official reports, historic resources board meeting schedule and assignments. I'd like to just uh, report uh, that the meeting of October 26th um, will be canceled. We don't have any items uh, that are critical uh, for that. And, uh, but we are going to meet on November 9th, um, assuming we have a quorum. So if any of you know you're not gonna be here, that would be good to know. Um, make sure we ha do have a quorum for that meeting. Um, we also have uh, the 23rd is canceled for obvious reasons. It's Thanksgiving. Um, and then, uh, um, and then uh, December 14th, we will have a meeting, but of course, another obvious cancellation is uh, December 28th. Thank you. Okay, okay uh, next would be a study session and where public comment is permitted, three minutes per speaker. Informational report on Eichler design guidelines and process for developing potential regulatory regulatory options. Shall staff have a report for us? Yes, briefly. We did provide an informational report regarding this project, uh, which was uh, authorized, directed by City Council last December. Um, you, we've talked about this. Uh, several of you have attended um, these outreach events. We've had several workshops now uh, to ascertain what the public, the, the Eichler owners in particular, uh, think about uh, going with Eichler uh, design guidelines, what's important to them, the values of these neighborhoods. Uh, we've had several workshops. We've had a workshop uh, with the two historic districts, the National Register Historic Eichler Districts. We've had uh, the memory event, which some of you attended as well, which um, went uh, during, I think, July it was, possibly August. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me, air quality problems. Um, and uh, so uh, that's what we've done to date. Our, uh, our um, consultants have drafted the administrative draft guidelines, and so we are uh, in the process of uh, working through those and getting those into a publication uh, at the end of this month, October. Um, we have targeted and reserved a room November 28th, after Thanksgiving, um, in the downtown library here for uh, people to come and learn about the guidelines, provide input, discuss. Um, so that's on the immediate calendar there. Um, a couple of things about the, the guidelines. Oh, and I should say the next uh, steps after that are indicated on the last page of this particular report. Packet page 10 uh, indicates our, our plans going forward um, beyond November 28th. Uh, we do intend to bring those to you in December, the first meeting of December or the only meeting of December, we will come to the HRB with, um, for discussion of those guidelines. Of course, you will get them at the end of October, so you will have a month to digest and uh, consider um, your, your comments. Then going forward after December, we would come uh, in January, I'm sorry, in December, we would also visit with the Planning and Transportation Commission um, and probably the ARB as well to share with them uh, what we're doing as far as potential code modifications, which we are working on uh, developing possible, possible code changes that um, people can weigh in on and the council can decide if they wanna direct us to move in a direction of uh, regulations of any kind. Um, all right, okay, getting back to that. Uh, so um, Eichler's, I should say we've received some comments on this, um, uh, recent comments. Uh, one uh, email came and uh, uh, noted that CCNRs are not in every Eichler track, CCNRs being covenants, codes, restrictions that talk about restricting to one story or other restrictions. Um, and I don't think that that was intended to, um, in the report, I said you know, other Eichler tracks, I didn't mean all other Eichler tracks. There are Eichler tracks that have CCNRs. Um, we know of several, um, so you know we can in the in the next report on this we can describe which ones we are aware of that have these CCNRs. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the other comment we did get somebody uh, commenting on um, just Eichler tracks and not being appreciative of you know the city getting involved um, with. Um, any kind of regulations or guidelines with respect to Eichlers. Um, 
I think I'm going to stop there. Uh, if you've read the report, you can kind of get a gist of where we're going with this. We'll have more to tell you in, um, in um, probably our November meeting, um, and you will have a chance to give us some, some uh, input before we have our public workshop, um, if you'd like, at that meeting. Thank you. On that public workshop, did you mention or do you know uh, that community workshop on November 28th, where the location the is? The downtown it? library right across the street from here on right. Thank you. Forest. Okay. Martin, could I? Yes. Roger, go ahead. Um, let's see, about a year and a half ago or so, I worked with some folks for on an, uh, Eichler right off Charleston. It turned out to be really... Um, sad and kind of a not a good situation where these owners wanted to do a two-story home and um, the neighbors came out and forced and complained and we then did some drawings for a one-story home and the owners just gave up part, part of the things you have to be careful of when you recommend uh, one story only is that and having lived here all these years and worked on many Eichlers and I live just you know, half a mile away. Um, you can do these one-story homes that literally they fill up the entire site. So there's hardly any open space. There's hardly any room for trees. It becomes this, this big blob of house. And they're really not, in my mind, very comforting for the neighborhood because you end up in these homes you know if you I don't know how your control is but in theory one story home can be 17 feet high so you end up with these houses that are you know just, just huge 15 to 17 feet high and they pop out now unless your unless your guidebook that you're pr proposing here specifically says you have to do an Eichler style home that might help but uh, I should have brought, I can, next time I'll bring my site plans I did. Um, it's just shocking how little um, yard area is left when you do one story homes uh, on, a, on a property. And um, so I'm, I'm not a huge, I just, I just don't understand the problem. I think I'd rather have a neighbor with lots of trees and foliage going and a two story home with the windows, you know, set up so that they can't look anywhere. To me, that's a much better solution than these. Um, they're, I'll have to bring it to show you. It's startling because there's just hardly any uh, yard left at all. I mean, you got the 20 feet in the back, but sometimes that's projected by another four feet or so. And so it's, uh, it's, it's kind of shocking that you're in a lot of these hikers are, have redwood trees and everything. So they're not going to be able to expand anyway. So if, you, if they can't, um, because of the redwood trees, of which there's a num numerous committed you know, property there, they won't be able to expand their maximum floor area because they can't tear down the, you know, take down the redwood trees. So I think there's, I just think it's, it's easy to say we should all have one story. Two story homes can be designed in such a way as individual review, you provide um, modest windows, uh, covered windows, all kinds of things that uh, keep the privacy uh, continuing. So um, I don't know what to say about all that, but I just think it's uh, um, too bad if it ends up that way. But. My understanding is the uh, maximum lot coverage is equal to the FAR. Is that the current regulation? Uh -huh. When building a one-story home yeah. uh, by choice, uh, any anybody can, in any district, Eichler or not, uh, build up to the floor area ratio uh, maximum for the site. Right. And there's no uh, design review or anything mm -hmm. else discretionary right. there. Yeah. 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 When, can I, um, because so, uh, Roger is, you know, uh, as an HRB member, I feel like I need to... Uh, you know, Correct me. Well, <laughs> make sure that you're, because you're an ambassador of what we're doing here with our yes. Eichler uh, guidelines, um, that, I, that I'd like to make it clear. Um, you know, this grew out of the single story overlay uh, broken process. I'll just call it that, uh, which was that 
uh, people self-select to be single story overlay, they come forward, the support level erodes and it fails. We've had that happen twice. As part of that action, council said, you know, what we really need is guidelines so that when people build a two-story home, there are guidelines for how to fit into the neighborhood to be compatible. So really, what, what I was referring to earlier about the CCNRs is background material. I brought it up because I had an email about it. People seem to think um, by my mentioning that many neighborhoods have those or some neighborhoods, Eichler neighborhoods have those, that that somehow is what we're doing here. We're not, it's just a background piece. You know, when I have the report and the guidelines in front of you, okay. to help everyone understand, you will understand that it's guidelines for two-story development, as well as guidelines for compatible additions to a one-story, uh, one-story addition. So it's, it's the whole gamut. It's not just for two-story homes, it's not just for one-story homes. Yes, uh, uh, Vice Chair Bauer. <clears throat> um, so I have a couple of questions um, that I don't expect you would answer, but I hope that in the report are answered. The uh, map that you provided us on page seven is very helpful because it shows us in the pink where the single story overlays are in effect and I, the two green districts are, are the uh, historic registered districts. But what I was hoping to see, and I thought I had seen in the first community meeting, is what the total area of impact would be. In other words, another color that would show what neighborhoods would be, would be um, um, that where the Eichler design guidelines would be effective. And the, the yellow, so the three colors that are here, yellow is every other <laughs> single family home in the city. So I guess the question, the reason I'm bringing this up is, I think it's important that we figure out uh, some kind of graphic that will show and, and, uh, homeowners if they're in or not. And is every Eichler going to be subject to the guidelines or just neighborhoods? So um, I'll call, I'll, that's nuanced. Um, subject to implies regulations. Um, at this point in time, there are no regulations that are being worked on other than potential for regulations. Uh, but the guidelines uh, can be used along with the IR two-story review process um, to ensure that the two-story home that ends up is compatible um, <laughs> to help with that. But as far as uh, subject to and required, uh, there's no there's no edict um, coming forward with, with these so guidelines. It's not gonna be, uh, it's not similar to the Professorville design guidelines, which are, um, whether they're, you know, they're guidelines mm -hmm. um, that I think determine the design, the, the ultimate design of additions and new buildings in Professorville. It, this would right. not be a similar. So, what, so let's um, review on that. Professorville is uh, regulated by the city's historic um, ordinance. All of the Eichlers uh, in town are not regulated by the city's historic ordinance. So there's no required discretionary review in those districts now. Okay. And there wouldn't be unless the council directs us to do so. So these guidelines aren't, by the way, going to put a single story overlay anywhere. They don't really address that. They're, they can be used in single story overlay neighborhoods that already exist right. for neighborhoods that want to elect in the future mm -hmm. to be single story overlay. Um, they can use them. Uh, people can use them even without single story overlay because when they propose a two story or a single story home, they're useful uh, as guidance. Okay, but every uh, individual review project would um, have to look at I'm not sure what the right terminology is, but would um, use these uh, Eichler design guidelines as part of that review process. Is that right? Yeah, so there, there would be a connection to the individual review, which is a discretionary process. For any discretionary process requiring discretionary city review, these would have some tie in to that. That's the intent of having them. Um, you know, one of the intents, the most important intent, 
to ensure that the two-story home that comes along has uh, greater compatibility than what sure. we've seen right. uh, without these guidelines. So um, another question which um, uh, is related to the email one that we received as board members from a, mem a community member, two of the districts, the single story overlay districts did not reach a level of support by the neighborhood to um, put that in place. But I note here there are nine that were successful. Do you know what the, can you describe what the vote or the neighborhood participation level has to be in order for a single story overlay to, to, uh, to become effective? Yes, there's the simple answer, which is at application by the neighborhood for such a single story overlay rezoning. Um, in it, there's percentages, there's 70% uh, participate, you know, of the participants, 70% of the neighborhood <clears throat> supporting it. If there are CCNRs that restrict the neighborhood to one story, you know, when Eichler put it together, it's 60%. However, the ordinance that we have in place for single story overlays is not clear what happens when the support, when people change their minds during the process. That's what happened with Royal Manor and Fair Court, the two that failed. They first came in with an application, so they met the requirement, but during the process with the Planning Commission and Council, people changed their minds and reversed from a yes, I support this, to a no, I don't support this. And so that's why those failed. Okay, but in the nine districts that uh, did have adequate support, they had to have 70% or 60% minimum if there was a CCNR Correct. Condition. But that, so, okay, so let me move on to CCNRs because those are pretty powerful and they're not subject to, um, well, they are subject to change if the community can, can um, you know, if the community decides to change them by vote, I, I presume. So uh, are there design guidelines in the CCNRs in these, some of these neighborhoods? I mean, I'm trying to get a, a sense of how much uh, design um, oversight the communities themselves have and mm -hmm. whether you know, there are lots, 2,000 Eichlers and, and they're in little tiny groups. So yeah. I it's kind of. So I can tell you what I know. And um, uh, the first thing is that I, I'm absolutely positive there are two architectural control committees that are active in this city. One is Charleston Meadows, which we've met with Charleston Meadows uh, group. And they do look at all projects coming through that affect the exterior of Eichlers in the Charleston Meadows neighborhoods. <laughs> or they try to, sometimes they're not successful convincing people to you know, come to the water trough. Um, there is Green Meadow, and that is a very large single story overlay and historic National Register district. And a representative of that district is here, Penny Elson, in the audience. And um, if you would like to uh, ask any questions about that, she's here. Um, but basically, they do have an architectural control committee. They look at things like color even, they, they have, um, they have an, an active group. So I'm assuming that as you develop the final language in the report um, that will come back to us, that you will quantify and to explain the very things you're ta we're talking about here, that there, there were 11 proposed single story overlays, it, well, explaining what that is, and then describing the, the thresholds for participation and for inclusion in a single story overlay district. The fact that two of them lost support. I think those things are Im important for the community. Um, I'd be interested in knowing how that support, if they reach the 70% level to get to a review by planning and maybe council, where did they end up? Where did the support sag to? Um, or how much support was withdrawn. 70% uh, is a very high bar. That's higher than required to pass a, a tax increase. And um, the only tax increase vote that I know of in Palo Alto that is routinely higher than the 66% requirement is the school district bonds, which last time I think received 82% support. But it's a really significant number and it I think will help this, the 
homeowners in the, in, who own Eichlers to understand how this works and the history of these um, uh, 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 zones. Uh, but uh, um, so, and I'd like to better understand, I guess, the, the, how Eichler design guidelines would affect an, in, an individual house that's not in a, res, uh, a registered district and not in a, a single story overlay district. So. We, that would definitely be part of um, what our plan is uh, as far as uh, getting to a workshop. Um, we have, you know, I think, sufficient time before then to you know, have a matrix um, to help people understand <coughs> you know, the relationship of the guidelines to existing sure. you know, uh, programs like the IR program, review program, mm -hmm. and single story overlays. Um, there are definitely background reports uh, you know, written over the last year that I've written um, that I can certainly forward you know, links to and have a, a you know, a, a, even for the next meeting, I could provide another informational report um, to help everyone to understand you know, how we got here, why the SSO, single story overlay, has been problematic um, and is not achieving, you know, is not uh, the perfect vehicle um, because of the erosion problem, et cetera. So the last thing is, uh, I think that the Charleston Meadows group and the uh, Green Meadow uh, Homeowners Association, because they have CCNRs, those need to be highlighted and described in a different way, because I, I would imagine the CCNRs and the architectural review um, groups of those two homeowners associations would drive, would be the first level of design review that um, the the Eichler design guidelines we develop as a city might, um, that their review I would gather, I, I would imagine is more thorough and probably more um, strict, but I'd like to know what that is too. Maybe it's just a simple, I want to do a second story, I want to do a first story addition, there's no review or it's minimal, uh, but w we need to understand how that works because I'm imagining they'll have greater control than what we develop here. Thank you, I think um, that's a great suggestion. I would like to perhaps invite uh, those two uh, groups that we're aware of, the ACC groups, um, to uh, you know, uh, present, uh, talk about it as far as how, how it goes. I can, I can ask them. I'm in contact with those sure. groups. I don't mean to, to, to take up all the time here, but the reason that um, CCNRs are important to me is I had a condo at Pajaro Dunes down in Watsonville for 15, almost 15 years. And we went through two CCNR revisions and I got very deep into the weeds about what those mean. And uh, they, have, they have design review there that's quite strict. It's all exterior. So I'd be, I mean, I, it was much more stringent um, than any of the building department or planning department requirements. So. It's important, and maybe you could ask them to forward them a summary of the CCNRs as they re relate to design to us. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a big report. That's a good idea. Um, what I would just let's just call out an example of a project that was reviewed by the CCNRs of the Green Meadow, and then right. came to this board, the Green right. Meadow, sure. the the uh, new building at the mm -hmm. community center. So that's an example of well, it came to us already looking. Eichler compatible and it needed to be tweaked, um, but but there was already uh, you know a qualif qualifying review or what, yeah, what have I, you. And, and uh, I I think we made modest small changes um, to their design because of that review. So um, anyway, just these are just some ideas that I think would help the community and help the board members understand where we're going with this. Any other board members for comments or questions? Um, I do. I have one. The um, is it true the uh, as these things are as the guidelines are being developed, the only buildings that involve the HRB are ones that are listed on the National Historic Register, or is it all Eichlers that HRB is, is going to be involved in if these uh, guidelines become uh, uh, published? Uh, that's not the plan, um, that the HRB would be involved in every Eichler zone. That's def definitely not the plan. Right. Um, the guidelines are to help the, the customers, the homeowners, the architects, um, because now we don't bring National Register Eichler homes 
to the board, and, and that's not going to change either. Right. Um, National Register Homes is not a uh, designation that, that is subject to our ordinance. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned the Architectural Co Co Control Committee on some one or two of the neighborhoods. Um, uh, what that committee uh, uh, decides, is there any enforcement to what their group uh, suggests to property owners? Do, do you know? Not by the city. It's an entirely separate um, activity. They're, they're looking at what's happening out there. Um, okay. that's, that's a private, CCNRs are a, an agreement, a private agreement that the okay. city is not a party to. Okay. Um, if the uh, guidelines do become uh, published and adopted by the city council, the, um, uh, how, when does the city involve that? It looks like I saw in the report today something about the individual review process. That's when the city of Palo Alto gets involved in reviewing additions. So um, these are items that we'll definitely cover in the, in the December report um, because we're studying the connections, but the possible connections and the potential for the council mm -hmm. to consider um, making these connections in a, in a um, zoning code kind of a way for the single family home neighborhoods. Okay. And I do see the uh, reference to individual review. Um, so right now the individual review ordinance only involves two-story homes, correct? And that um, right. continues to be the right, case. Yeah. That's only for two-story homes or second-floor additions. Right, okay. Okay. Um, I also see in our report today, limitation of the design guidelines. It's, um, uh, it's not prescribing um, an architectural style. So, uh, so I'm just saying, so, so ICAR guidelines would, would help in reinforcing the importance of compatibility but they will not legislate or prescribe in an enforceable way architectural styles that fit within existing homes. So it sounds like as of now, the, the strongest message about compatibility is our neighborhood architectural c control committees. Is that the current? Currently, yeah. yes. There is no, re with the city does not review right. Eichler, you know, one story any, anywhere in town. We don't look at one story homes um, right. except for Professorville. Yeah. <laughs> um, and are guidelines essentially just suggestions? That's correct. They are, they are intended to be helpful suggestions that okay. um, linked with an implementation plan for code modifications or right. you know, connections uh, right. written in a code to the IR program. I mean, uh, that's, that's when they would become more, uh, more useful for the city right. when reviewing projects, uh, but they're intended to be useful for homeowners and architects to, um, at, you know, until that time, they, they would be that kind of a document. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any other comments? Uh, Board Member, Vice Chair Bauer. Um, so is uh, Green Meadow is a National Historic District, uh, registered district, and it has architectural review through the CCNR process. But does Green Gables, it's also a... No, it does not. It does not they have, have CCNRs but no for architectural part of that tract, but um, they do not have an architectural control committee. Oh, okay. In fact, yeah, we, in, we had invited the, uh, a representative from that neighborhood to the Green Meadows workshop that we held for those two national districts. We only had one person attend from that neighborhood, um, and she was amazed at... Um, just how involved the Green Meadow ACC is in terms of what they're looking at, mm -hmm. um, because they don't do that in Green Gables. Okay, thank you. Um, I do see other members of the public who have arrived. If there are any members of the public like to speak to us on this for information or comments, uh, be welcome. Oh, and I see a member of the, if you could just state your name for the record, if any member of the public does uh, care to speak to us. Okay. Hi. All right, welcome. So because we are recorded, we just need your uh, name for the record, please. And sure. welcome. Um, my name is Siamak Sanari. Um, I, I live in Royal Manor, actually. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry. So actually, I was involved in the um, last time that we had this. So uh, worked in Royal Manor. And I actually was part of the group that was fighting against it uh, very much. Um, so most of the things I want to say here is the 
things that I learned through that process and working with the people of the neighborhood through that process. I think we had from one side uh, people that were very worried about privacy and um, the houses that people might come build or builders might come and build that they are very against the, the look and feel of the community. And the other side, <coughs> sorry again, uh, <coughs> people including like including me that we are we were worried about um, the space we need and we, you know we came here to raise our family and you know sometimes that is uh, kind of lack of space means we, we have to build a second story. Mm -hmm. um, some of the lots in the neighborhood really doesn't provide you enough space on the first floor because of the setbacks and where the lot is located and the context it's you, you have to build a second story. Mm -hmm. So what I want to again um, here uh, kind of uh, remind myself and the, and the team here is I think people had a lot of pushback against any regulation that would come and limit what they can build. They definitely, a lot of people have worked very hard for many years to be able to come and buy a house in Palo Alto. And they want to be able to use that land to provide a space for their family. At the same time, I think uh, the same people, even the same people that you know, I just mentioned, they will be open to that conversation to build something that is considerate to their neighbors, but they definitely want to use their space. Um, at the same time, that conversation, I think this, this, the initial support that it got um, or the continuing support that it had by the time that it still got to uh, city council is, was mainly around privacy and people were worried about privacy. So I think from my point of view, the main conversation here or the main challenge here is to how to actually provide a way for people to build a second story or build the space they need for their family and try to be considerate to their neighbors, um, think about the privacy and think about the look of the building and you know, how, how it's situated in the neighborhood and how is the effect of that new building to the neighborhood. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that the conversation, if it goes only about just preserving Eichlers or preserving Eichler neighborhoods, it very quickly goes back to the conversation, okay, either no second story or a lot of limitation on what the second story, how big it can be. Um, and, and I'm worried that then it gets us to the same situation that we had with that as it so that we had a lot of pushback from the community. Unfortunately, we had a lot of uh, conversation that didn't go to the you know, uh, right direction and uh, with a lot of friction inside the community. So I definitely want to avoid that situation to come back to us. Um, again, I think the main worry is there was how much people can build. Again, they, they, they have real need for their family. They want to use the space that they are allowed to build. And at the same time, we had the worries about privacy. And I think if we limit to those issues or, or think about the main concern that people had, I'm hoping that there is a solution for it. I think I almost didn't see anybody on the side of the people say, like, we don't like SSO, that they say, we, we, we wouldn't be considered to our neighbors when we build a second story, but at the same time, they didn't want to have a lot of limitations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public like to uh, speak, please? Okay. And welcome. If you could state your name for the record, please. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for um, discussing this item today. My name is Penny Elson, and I'm a resident of the Green Meadow Community Association. For today's purposes, I'm speaking as an individual, though previously I've been here as a representative of the neighborhood. We've taken no votes on this matter, and Green Meadow operates on democratic rules, um, so I can't speak for the neighborhood without their approval. But I can tell you that um, when the SSO was approved in Green Meadow, a vote was taken and it exceeded 80% support. Um, and we have those records in our archives if you're interested in looking at them from that whole period. Um, we also have a very active ARC. Green Meadow has um, an elected, annually elected board and we operate many committees because we have shared property. Um, and one of those committees is the ARC. They are very active, and as you say, they, do, they did look at the neighborhood project, but it's a little different when they're looking at individual homes. What we're talking about here is neighbors reviewing neighbors. And so what it comes down to in a meeting is 
a matter of persuasion. So the people who are on the ARC are very dedicated to maintaining um, the character of our historic Eichler neighborhood, um, but, but really we don't have an enforcement mechanism. Um, and we sort of rely on uh, neighbors um, respecting the supermajority choice of the neighborhood to, um, we, we also voted, by the way, on supporting the historic place designation. So, you know, the people who lived in the neighborhood at that time um, will remember that, you know, we all agreed on this. So that, that was sort of a statement of support. And we can fall back on that, but it's, all it is is a persuasive argument. It's mm -hmm. not, we don't have an enforcement mechanism, so I wanted to just offer that clarifying information because it sounded like maybe there was some misunderstanding about that. And, um, and then I just want to really quickly mention that I've had a personal um, experience with this. I have a neighbor who built a big window, raised a floor, raised a roof, so that it, her, her Eichler now looks into my Eichler in a way that invades my privacy in my master bedroom, my master bathroom, mm -hmm. my living room, my kitchen, and my family room. Um, and this, and when her lights go on at night, my backyard is lit up. Mm -hmm. So these homes are designed in a way where they really, Eichler and his architects design them to speak to each other. Mm -hmm. Um, in a neighborhood like Green Meadow. And I know that some of the neighborhoods you're looking at have sort of scattered Eichlers next door to different houses. So mm -hmm. perhaps we should be looking at historic neighborhoods differently. And this is my personal opinion. I want to just clarify again, this is not Green Meadow's opinion. But my thought is I am observing as you know the ADUs are moving forward in the neighborhood. I'm, we're seeing more and more additions on houses. And I'm observing casement windows going in on the front, on the facades of our Eichler homes. You know, people are making choices that mm -hmm. um, it's getting harder and harder for the ARC to to manage this. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just encourage you to. We're looking forward to reading the guidelines in Green Meadow, um, and I'm here today mostly to learn. Um, but I want you to be aware that. Enforcement is not something neighborhood associations do very well. Thank you. Uh, Penny, I have a question for you. Uh, please, uh, okay, okay, thanks. And then Roger. Um, uh, you mentioned about the uh, privacy concern for your personal experience. Um, do you know if the house next door, was that done prior to the ordinance of individual review where privacy is, is, is looked at, do you know? Uh, I think it was prior to that, but honestly, I can't remember when it passed. I'm, I'm just going to jump in because yeah. individual review has, has no application in Green Meadow. Oh, even for a two-story? They can't do two stories because they have we, a single story overlay. We're SSO. We're single story oh, overlay But you said something about privacy of second floor. Did you say windows are looking into your... No, she raised her floor. When an Eichler, if you raise oh. it. So now, like, their heads and shoulders are above the fence okay. that separates our two homes. Okay, so... so where I used to have privacy, I don't anymore. Okay. So the simple matter of raising a floor makes a difference is okay. what I was getting at. Adding a window in the wrong place, raising a floor. When you have a, when you have a house that's glass on one side, mm -hmm. it matters. Okay. All right. So yeah. it sounds like the, that case was it was no higher than 17 feet, therefore no IR review. Okay. Right. So, okay. So even, okay. And no two stories, right. They, okay. Well, they, they can't do two stories. Okay, so the idea, so just to get the, the logistics of the geometry, the privacy issue is if it's still, if it's only 17 feet, so the floor level is high enough to look in? That's, that's correct. Okay, so, and that's not considered a two-story, even though you raise the floor level. Okay, all yeah. right, that's why I mean, I'm... Well, I, I will defer to Amy, who's the expert. Okay. <laughs> yes. So there's no, um, you know, there's no uh, floor height regulation finish floor height regulation, unless there's a basement underneath. Okay, and yeah, then, yeah. Yeah. But in a 17 feet, you could raise the floor, and that's how you get the privacy concern. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, and, and also just putting windows on that side of the house. If, you, if it's high enough and you've got a big enough window, yeah. you put lights at the top, yeah. those lights will light the, the house next door. They sure. will light the backyard and the house next door. And, you know, it's, so it's it, these things, you know, this is the kind of thing we should be looking at. Yeah. Uh, were there any further questions or? Okay, uh, on that, um, is there anything in the uh, in your uh, architectural review committee that prohibits uh, for 
basements if, if homeowners want to expand a floor area? I, I don't know the answer to that question, okay. um, but I'm pretty sure a basement in Green Meadow, given our groundwater issues, is not likely. Well, if there's, okay, I understand. But in general, for Eichler's, uh, if there's no groundwater issue, basements are not prohibited. And then, That's correct. Yeah. I'll let yeah. Amy get that. Right. I don't know. I'm not on the ARC, so I don't know the details of oh, what they do. Okay. I'm on the Civic Affairs Committee. Oh, okay, right. Our sure. architectural review committee is separate from what I do, but I have been talking with them about this because they can't always get to these meetings and so we're tag teaming. Sure. Another yeah. question I just have quickly on, uh, on uh, design compatibility. Well, I, do, I have seen some um, Eichlers, one, including one story Eichlers, where the um, galvanized piping for the heating system is disintegrated and then homeowners are electing to put uh, ductwork on the roofs of these. Yep. And uh, um, are, you f are you familiar with any of your neighborhood guidelines that uh, talk about not having the ducts visible from the street because that affects neighborhood character? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Again, okay. I don't get into the details of it and I okay. haven't had that problem personally. So, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't know how you deal with it. Okay. I do know that in my, actually I should say, there, is, there are a couple of Eichlers in my immediate vicinity that have on the roof duct work and you cannot see it from the street. Okay, yeah, yeah. Whether yeah. or not that's because of the ARC, I don't know. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Board member uh, Kohler, you had a comment or, or a question? Uh, yeah, I did, but you covered almost everything I was okay. asking okay. questions. Good. But I, I do know that the, there are many options when you, you know, go from uh, concrete heating system to on the roof there. In ICORs especially, you can't, it has to go up there. There's no other way to do it as far as I know. Going. Go where? Tell you, me. You, you could do it inside, flat, very. Yeah. Um, well, actually, many people are doing it on the floor now. So you can, I, I've added, I don't want to like get yeah, into the weeds options. of this, but you, you can do it on your floor. Internally, you can lay a subfloor that, the, yeah. that it goes into. I've done that actually, and sure. we added, added a room on our house and did that. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, um, oh, yeah. Oh, yes. One more. Oh, and there's one more speaker too. Okay. 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 Thank, thank you so much. And, uh, and welcome. Please state your name for the record. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. Uh, my name is Unmay Shwartak. Um, I'm a resident of Royal Manor. Um, so thank you for your time. I uh, just bought, jotted down a few comments. So I want to start off with um, uh, Mr. Kohler bring, bringing up, and I'm sorry, I'm addressing you the right way, Mr. Kohler. It's uh, bringing up the right point about having a big benefit of bigger backyards. That is absolutely invaluable. If you expand on a single story, you absolutely lose all the room. So that's a great point. Um, as CMAC mentioned, the uh, single story application in Royal Manor got rejected mainly because our lots are constrained. There are so many different constraints on each individual lot that we cannot build on single story if, if that was an option. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and finally, uh, to, to, uh, to the previous speaker's point, um, single stories can also be raised. Royal Manor entirely lies in flood zone. That means anytime there's a new construction, we will have to build a new house that's like three feet or four feet raised. So, the main point is uh, in the guidelines, in the ICLA uh, design guidelines, privacy, like how do we tackle privacy issues? That's probably the number one concern. Um, pretty much restricting on single story is not really going to help privacy, that means. Um, and to end with it, I have a couple of questions. One is um, the perception I got when I read the report, the draft report is, uh, the Royal Manor SSO is still shows up at places as proposed because even though it's rejected and there is no proposal on table anymore. So um, I think that proposed language should be removed. That's one. And uh, a second question is, uh, is there any effort in the, uh, as part of the design review guidelines to provide concrete examples as these are, these are a single story houses that are compatible with Sorry, these are two-story houses that are compatible with ICLO neighborhoods. That's something um, I'm looking forward in the report. And yeah, definitely looking forward to the report for to answer how we can solve this privacy challenge together. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let me just make a comment. I think that's an excellent suggestion, having uh, yeah, some good drawing examples. I know in some of our other guideline publications, uh, there are examples of some things that are considered compatible or good, and some things are considered non-compatible or not, not good. Uh, so I think that'll help for the um, uh, educational point of view. Um, I think uh, Board Member Wimmer had, you had a question? Yeah. Okay, Bo uh, Vice Chair Bauer. Sorry to m monopolize this meeting, but um, I think one of the advantages of guidelines is that they, um, they let the community, and I'm using that in the broadest sense, know what is expected. And in the Professorville guidelines um, development, which I participated in, um, we ended up having exactly the kinds of things that the last speaker um, suggested would be helpful, and that is certain types of windows were more compatible, certain windows were not. Roof styles, um, landscaping, driveways, I mean, there were, there's lots of information there, and some of the problems, I think, that individual homeowners have when they approach design as the architects, as, as Roger described earlier um, in his experience, you know, there aren't there are no limits and so then what happens is the the first time neighbors see a project you know they're they're surprised there's a certain nimby attitude um, about any development here but guidelines actually can can focus attention and and um, I think limit some of the more <coughs> extreme uh, architectural styles in a district or in a neighborhood like an Eichler neighborhood so the purpose of this is actually to help all of the neighborhoods deal with um, development. And development is going to happen um, because those buildings were all built pre-earthquake uh, and pre-economic pressure that we have in this city. So um, they change. And of course, um, the example of the neighbor whose house r is raised because it's in a flood zone, that's a big issue. And maybe one of the things that the guidelines would suggest is that in cases where that happens, fences could exceed the seven foot high limit that they now, uh, the city now imposes or suggests. They don't really impose it, but, and there are lots of fences that are higher than seven feet. Um, but, and you, it, you, again, we used to be able to screen with planting, but if you have solar panels on your roof, you can't, you can't shade those by, um, landscape screening, so it's a it's a big issue. Anyway, looking forward to seeing the report. Board Member Kohler, your light's on. Oh, sorry. Um, well, I think it's been a really good discussion because it's uh, it's not going to go away, and um, a lot of, as the Eichler and well homes in general in Palo Alto age, and some of them are now 50, 60, 70 years old. They're starting to disappear. And um, so there's not only that, but there's also a lot of folks who are remodeling because they move into these homes and they aren't quite as large as they hope. And so they plan on remodeling. So this is a, it'd be good to have clear set guidelines as to what needs to be done or can be done. And so I actually didn't, uh, today's meeting, I thought there was an overlay in some of the, of course, you know, near where I live down more, you know, on the, map here um, but it's, anyway good thing to happen so, anything that you can do to help the, old, the homeowners and everything understand what their situation is, is is a good thing and that's part of the problem is that sometimes um, they don't know that they can come down here and get data or that uh, sometimes the data is not not enough for them to know also there's a just a side table, there seems to be some, sometimes when I come here and get answers from staff, I you know, just happen to be there, but we're, we're finding that some of the, out of, totally out of the, by, but some of the things that people are told in the uh, department across the street doesn't seem to jive with what I understand is the zoning ordinance. I have homeowners <laughs> coming back and say, oh, they said I couldn't do this or this. I said, well, I, I don't think so. So uh, next time it happens, I will let you know what, what it is. So. Okay, uh, Board Member Wimmer. I too agree that the guidelines are going to be really critical um, because 
it's sort of the lasting legacy of these neighborhoods that we have to think forward because the people who live there now are not going to forever live there. And how do you pass how do you pass that on to the next generation of residents and owners? Um, and I think it's um, really imperative for, I guess, the real estate agent community when those properties come up for sale, that any prospective buyer is well informed as to what, you know, what the neighborhood expectations are. And that maybe, I think these guidelines hopefully will fall into the hands of those real estate agents. And some real estate agents I know specialize in these, these homes and these neighborhoods. I think, um, just leaving a lasting legacy that will that will continue on to the next generation of, 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 of homeowners. But I do see the challenge of, you know, the guidelines are are set in place, but they're not supported by any legal, um, you know, legal binding. But I think the fact that they are in place, I, I think most people will will abide by them and listen, and I think it makes the, it maintains the character of the neighborhood. So I think, I think, I mean, I think it's nothing, nothing but positive. But I think it's great to get the community, like you guys who came and spoke today. I think that's one of the most valuable aspects of this meeting today is hearing from you. I think that's I really appreciate hearing what you have to say. Board Member McKinnon. Thank you, Martin. I think it's uh, the guidelines are a very good uh, idea, and I think it's also a good thing to reflect upon Eichler, who is really the legacy of Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, Eichler was really a fan of Frank Lloyd Wright, and, and he tended to build a house that was affordable in the Frank Lloyd Wright style. So that, that's an important legacy to remember here that we're carrying forward a tradition of a a pretty prominent architect. And uh, personally, I, I have owned a Frank Lloyd Wright house back in the, the Midwest and really enjoyed the, the style of it. And that's kind of the, the Eichler is a follow on to that as a more affordable concept. But uh, I guess the other question I have, did, were you able to survey any other communities to see what uh, they have used uh, in the way of guidelines and information you might have gained that would be helpful in effort in creating our guidelines for Palo Alto. Yes, um, Cupertino, Sunnyvale, those are the local examples of, um, and uh, our consultant you know, is well aware of those, has those, we have those. Some of those are um, regulations, uh, Eichler overlay zone kind of thing. Um, and some of them are guidelines. So, you know, regulations come in the form of zoning code that has prescriptive requirements. Um, overlay zone is kind of like a single story overlay zone, conservation district, what have you. And then the, the other one is guidelines and, and there are examples of all, all of those. Roger Kohler. Thank you. It's Roger Kohler, yes, okay. Um, <laughs> I just was thinking about, because I've lived down near the Eichlers for a long time and when I was a kid and all that, but um, the common story is that these things were being built and the uh, superintendent got a phone call and he'd go over to lot X5 and he says, well, the owners don't want this, they want to move this wall over here and then they just do it. <laughs> so. It's a, they had an easy way of building. If they uh, literally every house, it, um, a lot of the homes look the same on the outside, but when you get inside, there's sometimes walls are different, this or that, and they just went ahead and built them and sold them. And it was a, it was a pretty good setup they had going. Not like today in Palo Alto, you know, you have to get everything checked two or three times. So, but. Um, I think Dyckler's a really, uh, and I've been in a lot, I've worked on a bunch of them and had homeowner, I had some of the kids, but not to drag on, but um, good. I'm glad we're getting this resolved and so everyone who wants to do something will have guidelines as to what to do and how to, how to uh, approach it. That's a pretty big, de big deal. Whoops, sorry, thank you. Turn it off. Is that electrified? <laughs> right. The um, uh, 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there a, um, uh, what was the general source for um, engaging on the idea of uh, uh, potential guidelines for Eichlers? Uh, is it just come through, yeah, what is there? City Council. City Council. So yes. city, um, uh, not neighborhood, um, neighborhood neighbors? Well, you know, yeah. City Council yeah. and the neighborhood during yeah. the single story overlay processes okay. that we went through. There was a, the, in 2016, we had two successful and two unsuccessful single story overlays. During that process of that year, uh, we had some folks say, you know, we just want some guidelines. We don't want to be a single story overlay. Um, so, you know, that, that statement was, I'm paraphrasing of course, um, but that's, that was the sentiment of some that, you know, we don't want to have a restriction of a one story. We want to be able to build. We, you know, value our privacy, as was said, you know, help us with some alternative. And Council Member Holman, please. Yeah, Amy uh, depicted that very clearly. It's, um, um, there are some neighborhoods that are predominantly Eichler that also have spotted around a few two-story homes. So a single-story overlay doesn't necessarily apply in those, and that seems to have been a point of a lot of contention uh, on uh, the neighborhoods where single-story overlays are uh, sought. Um, and so, so that was that was one thing. Another is, another is that when there is even a neighborhood that has CCNRs, as I, you you brought up, uh, Vice Mayor Bauer, in, in your uh, questioning, that not all neighborhoods that are CCNRs that that have CCNRs have a have a review committee either. And even with that, if there is a disagreement, and Amy said this, I'll say it in a different way. Even with that, even if there is a uh, CCNR, our CCNRs, and even if there is a design review committee, there is no enforcement. The only enforcement would be a lawsuit by neighbors against neighbors. And people don't really want to go do that. So um, I think what Board Member Wimmer brought up is like having the guidelines that would help um, you know, take some burden and provide some clarity for the neighborhoods um, because right now it, it could get to be a neighbor versus neighbor thing. The other thing that, that um, this conversation, and, and you raised some really good questions and made some really good comments, um, is that perhaps there could be a, uh, an opt-in or however, I'm not gonna try to say how it should be, I don't know how it should be at this point, um, but maybe some could adopt it as requirements and some as guidelines. There might be some might be some interest in that by some neighborhoods, but that's for another discussion. But just uh, maybe it isn't a one size fits all. Okay. Any other board member comments, questions, um, staff, uh, council members? Any other comments? Uh, board member Bauer. So, in following up on uh, council uh, woman uh, Holman's comments, I would assume that guidelines would. Um, be superseded by any CCNRs by a local Eichler homeowners association, and that would be important because CCNRs can be changed by the homeowners with a, whatever appropriate vote, but it's usually a pretty high bar. And I wouldn't want the city's guidelines to supersede a, a neighborhood guideline, and that's following on the notion that one size doesn't necessarily have to fit every community. I mean, every neighborhood community. Okay, anything else uh, on this topic? Um, okay, um, I just want to conclude that I uh, agree uh, having guidelines that are published, uh, again, it's useful for owners, property owners. Also, I would suggest it's also useful for um, uh, developers that want to um, uh, increase or, or modify homes in these areas. Um, by having uh, examples published of here's something that's recommended, something that's not recommended, I think it just helps uh, uh, speed up uh, that review process to get something that will be more compatible and, and useful for the neighborhood. So I think it's, I'm also in support of these guidelines. Anything else before we move on? Okay, thank you so much for that. All right, uh, next on our agenda item is, I think it's, um, Approval of minutes, yeah, approval of minutes from September 14th. Any amendments or motion? And thank you for members of the public for coming. Thank you so much, good, appreciate it. Any uh, a motion to amend or approve the minutes of September 14th? Um, yes, I wanted to um, clarify two things. 
One um, was when I was um, when I was talking about the architectural tour in San Jose, and I brought a book that was um, it was by the architects called Wolf and Higgins, and in the minutes it says Wolf and Higgins, just okay. in case uh, someone's looking back. Someone's looking at what page of a packet um, page? I guess there's on packet page 23 at the bottom on the far right, it says Wolfen. Um, and then there was another sighting of it on, on page 24 at the top, the third line down on the right also. And then, um, and then also something I said on um, packet page 22, I was, t we were talking about the Mills Act and I was suggesting that Pat to seek to CKO possibly be one of our pilot program participants. And where it says in that first paragraph, it's the second line from the bottom. I said she is very adverse, but I, I think I was trying to say <laughs> she is like well, she is well versed because she, I was suggesting her because she has a Mills Act contract, I believe, in Southern California, so she wouldn't be adverse. She is well versed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and recently we were talking um, at our subcommittee and we were talking about how important it is to read the minutes <laughs> because something like that's a perfect example. And I, I'm getting better at reading the minutes and I'm gonna correct my, my adverse statements. <laughs> I, I was just gonna say that uh, these, little, these little inaccuracies are intentionally put in here to see if we okay. read this. True. Great. Okay, a motion to um, uh, approve as amended. I'll move to approve as amended. A second? It's been second. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. I abstain. Okay, uh, next item on our agenda is subcommittee items. I see none listed here. Any subcommittee reports? Well, the um, Millsack subcommittee met last week and uh, with Emily's help, tremendous help. We are, um, be, we're fleshing out the, what we hope will be an ordinance presentation. And I think the timeline um, is that this board would review and hopefully approve the plan that we are developing in um, March. Yeah, probably March. We have another meeting scheduled for uh, early November, primarily because it's difficult, I'm out of town for the next two weeks, so. Um, but we're making great progress. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other uh, subcommittee comments? Okay, uh, next is board member questions, comments, and announcements. Um, uh, Council member Holman uh, suggested that uh, the board members uh, um, take a look at and uh, perhaps discuss the idea of a sponsorship uh, level for the 2017 conference. This is 2017 on this piece of paper, so it should be. Yes, the new brochure is not yet published, so uh, those are the uh, sponsorship levels for 2017. Okay. If there's any change, it would be minor. Right, yeah. Okay. For 2018. Right, okay, thank you. All right, um, does any board member like to um, bring up this topic of uh, sponsorship? So, okay. Can I just, inter oh, I, sure, I have yeah. to run off to another meeting, sure. but I'd be happy to answer any questions individually or if the chair would like to convene some folks because this wouldn't be a Brown Acted thing because it's not an HRB action. Okay, yeah. Correct. Um, uh, I mean, run that through staff just to make sure right. um, because you'd be hopefully publicizing your support as, H as the HRB. So just clarify for staff that there wouldn't be any kind of Brown okay. Act issue. Happy to talk with anybody. Um, one thing I didn't say earlier that I should say is that um, even though it's uh, not until 2018, uh, the uh, earlier sponsorship is very helpful in the CPF uh, uh, entity being able to make plans for the conference, and those plans are being put in place um, very, very soon. So a decision about whatever sponsorship you might be interested in entertaining would be um, helpful brought forward soon. Very good. Thank you. I, I actually had one question before Karen leaves, because last meeting we we were brainstorming and talking about what great topics we'd like to listen to at the conference, but then we realized, well, maybe the conference has already been sort of mapped out and the, the, they don't need any suggestions. I mean, we spent like t five minutes throwing out great ideas of what they could talk about, but 
we don't know if it's is it too late to suggest or no not at all oh not at all okay and that's one of the purposes also of the meeting next Wednesday at 2:30. Okay. Okay. Um, do we have a, I don't have a confirmation yet, but we're trying to get the uh, co conference room out here in the lobby where we met last okay. time. So okay. no, not at all. There's a structure that's established that's kind of like their template for how they do uh, the conference, but the subject for you know tours and topics and stuff isn't established. Okay. There are so, suggestions thrown out, but it's not established. So, uh, out here is where we're hoping to get confirmed city hall, but we're hoping the the council conference room out there. So maybe knowing that Karen has to leave, maybe uh, as a group we can just come up with a couple of those ideas that maybe we had last last time, and whoever can go to the meeting might talk on our behalf as to what items we might we might have been interested in. Okay, does that need to be agendized, or we can discuss well, we those? Well, we don't have a, yeah. a meeting before the next. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think just a, a recall would be, you know, put put the recall button. Uh, you know, um, I recall something. Maybe this is how my mind works, but I recall yeah. something about a, a, a kind of cocktails, um, and and something the day before the the Wednesday before the conference, some kind of pre-conference something mm -hmm. um, that isn't officially in the conference schedule per se but it's for the community and in celebration of this conference being here some kind of something for officials well I, I know one item that um, chair Bernstein mentioned was compatibility compatibility differentiation of the interior Sec secretary of the interior standards for rehabilitation I think it was what some of the some of the things that the council was asking us to sort of train them on we thought that that could be a possible good mm -hmm. um, topic Martin. So, <clears throat> because I'm a member of the past board, last night um, the the past organization I think is fairly um, it's not quite decided, but they have an annual meeting in May, and <clears throat> the uh, discussion was to. Um, put that meeting at the end of the conference on Sunday. And that's a public meeting. It's open to anybody. And um, we also talked about having the meeting, that, that meeting and this, it's an awards presentation, the Wednesday before. <laughs> and um, I think we decided that it wouldn't be the Wednesday before, but it would be the Sunday afternoon because the conference ends on Sunday morning. There are a few events Sunday morning and then most people who are out of town leave. But so we might want to coordinate something if the HRB is going to do something. And certainly anyone who wants to come talk about compatibility, that would be terrific. I'm sure you could work that in. But just wanted to make everybody aware of that. I had one other thing that I, I actually occurred to me last week. I've been watching the discussion in mostly in the newspaper about the grade um, separation on the um, Caltrain corridor yeah. and <clears throat> one of the really significant crossings is San Francisco Creek which is an historic structure in Palo Alto and I don't think anybody has been talking about that because that's just a train crossing but I wonder if Amy you could um, make uh, the committee since it's a, a city committee that's looking into this aware of the fact that there's a historic structure there, and that's p going to be part of the discussion, I think. What is the, the historic structure? It's the train, the trussell the bridge. The tr trussell. Yeah. Now, the grade separations are really at, at um, Churchill and East Meadow and Charleston that are most difficult. Um, but the, the bridge, I think, in this upgrade is also going to be part of the discussion, although I suspect it will just be destroyed. Or maybe we can take it out to the Baylands. <laughs> no, and also, you know, and I don't know. Anyway, yeah. it, we say it's historic. Uh, it's not. It's not a listed historic structure. Yeah. It's actually. Um, it, it is. Uh, uh, Amy, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's on the list of potential historic structures because when I was scanning all of that information in, that was on the Danes and Moore report in 1990, it was, it was listed as a potential. It, it actually, it's, I don't know, it's, what, 1890s or something? It's really old. 
And that structure spans two counties, spans two counties, I think. <laughs> yeah, also it does. Two cities, two counties. Because the yeah. San Francisco Creek is a yeah. separation line between San Mateo yeah. and Santa Clara. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, any other uh, comments uh, regarding the um, sponsorship issue? Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is a CPF a 501c3 yeah. non profit? It is. As Councilmember Holman mentioned, yeah, there, there's no historic resources budget. Um, we don't have a budget. <laughs> There is a budget oh. for training that's required uh, for the oh, HRB oh. to maintain their, um, you know, under the CLG sure. rules or whatever. Yeah. But as far as donations, again, it seems like uh, that's just going to be individual members donating. Is that good? So I would like to suggest that the, um, since this is not an official board action, but is a private action by board members, that we wouldn't necessarily if we decided to get together and make a single contribution that, that met one of the levels of sponsorship, that it would be an individual sponsorship by members of the HRB, and that would be it. So it's a private contribution. It's, it's individuals coming together, and thus I think that doesn't violate the Brown Act requirements. I think you'd want to have the attorney Right. Give a judgment so, on that because it sounds like you're still making a quasi no, well, HRB. I, I just think it'd be individuals are sponsoring and uh, you know are are making a contribution as a sponsor, and they happen to also be HRB members. So we're not uh, we would not be representing the HRB, thus representing the city. Mm -hmm. We would be doing this as individuals, and it would I imagine fall under the socialization um, kind of exemption. So if we all got together and had dinner and didn't discuss board um, business, that's not a Brown Act violation. Yeah, and I, I would say the city is already, you know, a sponsor, sponsor you know, sure. a, a sponsor and you're part of the city too. So, um, and you know, let's face it, this is not a development project. This is <laughs> something different than that. I think we, we, we don't have to have too much concern about how, how it plays out. So we don't necessarily have to have this conversation on right. camera. Right. Okay. So I would suggest we have it off camera. Okay. Okay. Anything else uh, before we move toward adjournment? Any announcements? Anything else from staff? Okay. Okay. All right. Anything else? Uh, board member Kohler. I'm board member Roger. I'm well, board I just, member. Well, I just brought up the, uh, <laughs> the horrible fires that are going on up north of us and all the historic structures and things that were up there are now gone. It's a, lot of them. a huge, huge. Uh, we have friends who are just over the hill, and uh, uh, he has a big property. We did a, did a house there, but it's now creeping up onto him on the other Glen, uh, whatever. Glen Allen. Glen Allen over the hill, and so that's it's still mm, moving. It's terrible. It's, yeah. What? What? The winds are getting oh, worse the wind. today. Oh gosh. Okay, anything else before we adjourn? Uh, I, I move we adjourn. Okay, great. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.